really tight seal here to minimize any leakage of ions across. Okay, so it's a special type of phospholipid here. And so transport in and out from the cytoplasm into the matrix is tightly regulated. And we'll see in the slide, we'll talk about how, how pyruvate's imported through a symporter for symporters and how ATP and ADP are transferred through antiport mechanism. AD, ADP enters to be rephosphorylated, ATP transported out to deliver those uh, high energy phosphates to power life. Okay, we'll talk about that as well. So this is a, a membrane that really regulates the entire the, the internal environment very carefully. Okay, now the outer membrane, okay, is really porous, very, has very large pores. I think the pores are called porins. They're large diameter pores. In fact, anything smaller, I believe, than 5,000 Daltons in size can readily diffuse these large pores into the intermembrane space here. So this really has a chemistry almost identical to the cytoplasm, really the same, because this is a very porous, almost like a screen door. Just things move right in. Real big stuff, real big proteins, they, they're too big to fit through, but every, every dissolved ion or sugar or amino acid, everything that's small, just moves readily between the cytoplasm and the intermembrane space here, okay? So it's really, this, uh, in this environment, it's very similar to the cytoplasm, all right? Of course, we also know that in here are uh, DNA molecules, what we call the mitochondrial DNA, their own ribosomes, some transfer RNAs, some of the machinery to, uh, that they use to transcribe their own genes, and translate them into protein, okay? And many of the important proteins in the electron transport chain are derived from the mitochondrial genome. But most of the proteins that function in the mitochondria come from genes in the nucleus. So when this organelle, this former free-living bacterium became an organelle, there was a gene transfer from mitochondrial DNA to the nuclear chromosome. So, which means it can no longer live on its own anymore. It's truly dependent upon the cell that it lives in. The cell is dependent upon it for its energy, okay? This improved yield of ATP because of this organelle enables active multicellular beings like ourselves to exist. We could never be as active. Warm-bloodedness would have never evolved. The high-functioning rapid nervous systems could not evolve. Depend, depending, depending on glycolysis only. The AP yield is too too low, and active life could not have evolved like it has. It depended upon a, a mechanism that, that produced a high yield of ATP, stripping electrons from high energy molecules and delivering them ultimately to oxygen, okay? And that's because oxygen having, being so electronegative, it's in such low energy state, they can pull electrons way down that energy gradient and release a lot of that energy. Okay. okay, let's start off and let's visit glycolysis. We're going to try to focus on the the uh, sort of the highlights, and not go through. We'll look at some of the nitty gritty, but we're not going to do a complete biochemical analysis. It would take a lecture to do this, and that's for a later course. It's just a get an introductory foundation course. So glycolysis, okay, you know it's the, the ancient anaerobic pathway, okay? It can run in the absence of oxygen. In fact, your muscles, when you're uh, sprinting really hard to run away from the cops or somebody trying to hurt you or score a first down or return a tennis serve, that burst of power requires pain to be so fast that your circulatory system can't deliver oxygen fast enough to your muscles to allow them to conduct aerobic respiration. So for a sprint, a burst of energy, your skeletal muscles work on glycolysis. So your skeletal muscles, we call them facultative anaerobes. They can, they can work on glycolysis for a sprint, but if you're a long distance runner, of course, you're powering your body on aerobic metabolism because you need the high ATP yield. So your body can kind of adjust depending on the level of exertion. We all know that you can't sprint for 20 miles, right? You can sprint for 100 meters, but you can't sprint for 100 miles, okay, for example. All right, so this happens in the cytoplasm. Doesn't require any membrane, okay, for this to occur. So it, again, it, it, it first evolved in prokaryotes before internal membranes were present, all right? 
and it's, it includes, uh, there are 10 reactions, okay, in glycolysis, everyone catalyzed by an enzyme, of course, no exception there. And we can divide them into two sets, the first five reactions, we can say they are the, uh, they are the energy requiring reactions, they're in the kind of the rust color box. This is where the, the cell has to spend energy to make it. It's like investing. You gotta have money to make money. Doesn't that piss you off? It's like, damn, I wanna make, I wanna invest in the stock market too, but I don't have anything to invest. How does this work? That sucks, man. Okay, so the cell has to spend energy, ultimately to make energy. It's gonna cost the cell, in, this, uh, in these reactions, the cost is two ATP. What the cell has to spend to, sort of energize some of the substrates in this process, okay? Two ATP, or, or spent, okay? That's in the first fiber. And we'll look at the reaction in a little bit of detail here, okay? At the end of these first five reactions, the product, the sugar is split in half <coughs> to two molecules of glycosylide three phosphate, okay? So at the end of the first five, you've got two molecules of this around high three phosphate. I'll direct it like that. Actually, that's not exactly true. You actually have a, a molecule of glycerol high three phosphate, something called dihydroxyacetone phosphate. But the two isomerize back and forth because this guy is funneled into the next reactions. Okay, it drags the other molecule just sort of flows into it, so that ball of mass action. <coughs> okay, so this is the one that we metabolize further. So that's the first five reactions. Now the second five reactions are the energy payoff. Okay, uh, we'll stick with the words in the slide there. The energy releasing reactions. Okay. And they're going to produce uh, a total of four ATP. Okay, so they're going to yield or they're going to, let's not put yield there. That might be the wrong idea. Produce four ATP. So if I spin two and produce four, my net yield is four minus two equals dos amigos. So that'll give you a net yield of two ATP. You can see it's uh, down here in the summary here. But there's something else produced that's uh, going to generate some energy payoff later on. And that is. Uh, some high energy electrons are stripped away onto an activated carrier that nicotin amide adenine dinucleotide. Again, it's an RNA base activated carrier, and this one carries high energy electrons. Okay? So we're going to produce uh, two NADH. And it's got that hydrogen on there. It's, so this is nicotin amide adenine dinucleotide with a hydrogen attached. So the hydrogen attached, you know it's been reduced. You know it's, it's received electrons, stripped away from the sugar. When you receive an electron to bounce a charge, you have a proton, you've got a hydrogen attached. Okay? And it's derived from its oxidized precursor, the NAD plus. So you add two electrons plus one proton, you get two NADH. Okay? Actually, uh, yeah, that's what you're adding. You actually, uh, Taking up two protons and two electrons, you keep two electrons, one proton, the other proton you release into the environment, into the fluid. Right. So this high energy shuttle, this activated carrier NADH, okay, is carrying those electrons at high energy. And they can be used later on to help uh, power ATP synthesis through the chemiosmotic process at the end. All right. At the end of the energy releasing reactions, our sugar has been degraded down into two, sorry for the sloppiness here, the, the, the final end of glycolysis in terms of what's left of the sugar, you have, I'm to this out of the way a little bit. People out the door, so in case there's a fire, we all burn to death. And that. <laughs> fire marshal, come on and arrest me. You're arrested. Okay, we'll be the first one. All right. <laughs> I'll never tell you why. Okay. Uh, two, she deserved it. <laughs> two pyruvates, okay? Pyruvate is a three carbon 
So the blue coast is six carbon split into two, three carbon pyruvates. We'll see the structure in a bit. Okay, and I'm never going to ask you to memorize these structures, but we'll look at them and uh, we'll kind of understand when we talk about how things are removed, you'll see what's happening here. So that's the end of the energy releasing reactions, two pyruvates, each are three carbons. So all six carbons are counted for. And again, our net yield has been two ATP, right? We produced four, we spent two. But these two three carbon pyruvates, there's enough energy there left to produce another roughly 28 to 30 ATP. But in the absence of oxygen, and if you don't have the machinery, this is as far as you can go, okay? And so for organisms that generate ATP through something called fermentation, uh, this is the best they can do, okay? And again, for some of our tissues, like our skeletal muscles, when you need energy fast, because it is a fast process, you can produce ATP fast, but the yield is low, but it's fast is good sometimes. Life is on the line. Okay. Now here's more than nitty gritty. Okay. A lot of words there. Ooh, I hate to read words. Let's look at uh, and it's not, uh, the figures from this publisher kind of suck. Kind of read on the slide. Um, but here's the first five reactions of the energy requiring reactions. Uh, here's glucose and the first reaction and uh, the enzymes are here. The first reaction involves, here's where we spend our first molecule of ATP, and ATP uh, is used to phosphorylate the sugar on carbon-6, which is what's called a glucose 6-phosphate, and this enzyme is a hexokinase. And you understand what kinases do? They transfer phosphates from ATP to a target, in this case it's a sugar. Now once this sugar is phosphorylated, it can no longer leave the cell. It's trapped inside the cell now. Okay because the phosphate's charged and it's no longer uh, can es 